Okay, thank you uh, for coming out and watching the EMS Grand Rounds today. My name is Zach. I work for the trauma program at University Hospital. Uh, thanks for uh, to Jason Adams, who's a flight nurse from University of Utah Air Med. I've been lucky enough uh, when I was working at Air Med to fly with Jason a lot. Uh, we have seen some crazy patients together, and so I'm here to tell you uh, he's got great experience in this subject. Um, we've seen it together. So uh, thank you, Salt Lake City, for uh, having us out and letting us use your building and, and getting us ready to go today. If you have any questions for Jason, you can submit them on our website, emsgrandarounds.com. There's a message, uh, message box. Just type them in, and I'll be monitoring that so I can pass that information on to Jason. So, Jason, it's yours. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> I appreciate you. you. Thanks, you guys, for having me. It's an honor. Hello in cyberspace, and uh, thank you, Salt Lake City Fire, for hosting us here. It's great to be here with you. Um, this is a pretty interactive thing, so I welcome your questions, uh, also both here in the group and um, wherever you're listening from. Uh, send those over, and I'll do my very best to answer. Um, let me just take a brief moment and say thank you to our public service um, people, our public safety. Uh, you guys and gals do amazing things, and it's an honor to be a part of that system. Um, oftentimes we'll come on scene and respond to a call and we'll get there and, and I'll think to myself, well, what are we going to do? You guys took care of it all. And then there's that friendly reminder, well, you could help us by getting the patient out of here and flying them. So i um, grateful to be here, grateful to serve with you. I consider it a great honor. Um, so today we're going to be talking about spinal trauma. Um, it's a pretty in-depth topic. This presentation will be pretty image heavy, uh, so hopefully you'll get a good view of some of the images that uh, you'll be able to see as we talk. Uh, again, as we go along, please feel free to ask questions or bring up points. I'm sure there's a vast amount of experience wherever you are, uh, and I welcome that experience um, as we go. So the first thing I'd like to start off by when we talk about spinal trauma, think about what you do when you arrive on a scene with your patient. You've probably maybe received a little bit of information as to what's going on, um, maybe not much, or maybe all you hear is a fall or an MVC or something like that. And when you get there, everybody's pretty good. You do your assessment, you get things going, um, you get your patient packaged, and you either transport them or fly them or however you're going to get them to more definitive care. But the thing that would be really cool is if we had x-ray vision, right? If those x-ray glasses really worked, and somebody in the crew, you know, you just grab it out of your bag, throw those x-ray glasses on, you can do a quick look and see if you see anything. Um, maybe one day that'll be cool, right? Those virtual glass things that are coming out, you might be able to do that and do a portable x-ray or something. But since we don't have that now, my goal today in talking about spinal trauma specifically is to maybe give you some tools um, that you're not already aware of that you can use as you respond to scenes or you get information en route to a call that'll help you be able to treat the patient. Because let's face it, quite honestly, uh, when we respond to a scene, we're going to package our patient and we're going to assume everybody's got a broken neck, back, and everything, right? We're typically going to do full spinal precautions, put them on a backboard, uh, get them all packaged, and, and get going. And so uh, hopefully by talking about this, we'll be able to uh, give you some clues. So I do have some objectives. The biggest thing I think that's important is to cover the anatomy. So we have a good understanding. I have a couple of uh, things we'll do uh, being interactive. I can't see you in virtual world, but uh, please feel free to raise your hands as we do some hand raising and stuff um, so that it sticks with you, which uh, hopefully it will. So understanding the anatomy, of course, of the spine and the vertebral column. Mechanisms of injury are huge, so we'll definitely uh, talk about that and go into that a little bit. And then treating spinal and neurogenic shock, which I bet all of us in our experience have had the opportunity to see uh, at some point or another. Um, this is a trick one, airway management and people with spinal injuries, right? What do we do when somebody has a, a cervical injury or something and we need to get a more definitive airway or something like that? So we'll address that. Um, and then, of course, other spinal issues. These are issues such as, um, in fact, you and your communities that you serve probably have frequent patients that are paraplegics, quadriplegics, and you might face um, some issues that they have to deal with because of uh, what's going on with their spine. Uh, so let's jump right into it, anatomy. Okay, I have some, uh, again, I said it's pretty picture heavy. Um, here's a good picture of the, the spine that we're dealing with. Looks kind of cool outside, right? Like that, it's pretty amazing. It's also amazing to think all vertebrates have some sort of 
uh, anatomy like this, and, and uh, it's pretty orderly. It's also amazing to think how strong this thing is. I mean, if you really think about how big those bones are, the human skeleton, um, you know, with the, uh, the padding and everything in between, it protects the, the thing that's coming from the brain telling the body to do everything else in this long uh, thing. It's pretty amazing to me. Um, it's sturdy. It takes a lot of weight. Imagine jumping up and down and the, the pressures that are exerted, and it seems to not cause any issues unless it's too hard, which we'll talk about. So let's talk about uh, just diving into the actual ver uh, vertebra. So um, you have the spinous processes, which you can palpate and fill. Um, we may do that on scene. Uh, if you're like me, I also work in the emergency department at times, and it's, it's always uh, somewhat entertaining when, uh, if the patient's doing okay, of course, and we're not making fun of the patient, but you ask them to say yes or no, and you touch the back, and you're, you're tapping those spinous processes, and you say, does this hurt, yes or no? And they say, well, it kind of hurts, I don't know. You know you'd say, can you say yes or no for me? Uh, we may palpate and feel that it's broken. That can give us some hints as well um, about uh, any spinal injuries. Uh, there's a really cool, I love body worlds. It's a great picture um, of the spine, uh, of the nervous system exposed at that uh, posterior view. I mean, it's pretty cool. Um, you can see where it branches off here with the pictures. Um, and we'll talk about this here. Kind of looks like a horse's tail as you move down there. And we'll talk about some conditions associated with that um, all the way up to the brain. Think about the millions, I mean, upon millions and billions of signals just for me to stand and talk and walk around and move my fingers. I mean, it's incredible. All those signals that are passing through. And imagine what can happen if even one of those is interrupted. We'll talk about the spinal cord and the anatomy of the spinal cord. You have uh, the way that the signal travels. Really, it's an ingenious electrical system if you really think about it, right? If any of you have electrical problems at home, I know I have. If you bought an older home, you have to go through and look at stuff. And you turn on a light switch and one light turns on and you think the other one should turn on and that doesn't turn on and then you change the wiring or you, you work with it and then that light turns on and that light doesn't turn on. So imagine the complex system here. And so you have nerves that are traveling up down the central cord and nerves traveling down to give us our motor function, our sensation and all of those processes happening uh, simultaneously. And so imagine an interruption there of that cord. So let's start with our uh, spinal overview here. So you have seven cervical vertebrae uh, you have your 12th thoracic, and one of the reasons that, uh, just by way of memorization, it's kind of hard, that's where that x-ray vision would come in handy, right? You can say, oh, it stops about here, and then we have a thoracic. The reason they changed the name is that's where the ribs begin to attach, okay? And so now we have to have a different name from the cervical. And then you have your five lumbar, so and obviously it gets thicker as you go down. I call it the coccyx, thanks to a certain movie, right? Don't crack your coccyx. Uh, but the sacrum S1 and S5. Then we're going to talk about innervation from the spinal cord. Um, you can see, I'm going to leave this image up for, here for a minute. All of the amazing things as it travels down the spinal cord through the spinal column, uh, all of the things that those do that connect to that central uh, cord there. Um, so you can imagine, and we'll get into this in detail, if something were injured here at C. Uh, seven or eight, I guess C8 is an anomaly, but most people are C7. Um, what can happen if one of those areas is damaged or the signal flow is interrupted, as we talked about electrically? So the biggest thing, this is a really key point, uh, thinking of your patients when you're responding, is that knowing where things are innervated, Let's start in with the cervical vertebrae. You guys like that picture over there? I don't have my laser pointer, sorry, so I'll be pointing here. Um, you guys see anything abnormal in that? Roughly C2, yeah, we'll talk about it. So this, this looks good, you can see here. And then here you see a little uh, crushing. It doesn't
So let's talk about some important vertebrae, the first two, okay? So C1 and C2, the atlas and the axis. So to do this, if you guys will take your finger, your uh, left hand here, make a circle, okay? Then take your thumb and put that through. This is your axis and atlas, okay? Atlas is holding the skull, right? The skull kind of rests on there. Granted, you have muscles and ligaments and everything and vasculature. doing the fill for packaging right that's where you have your towel rolls you tape the head like crazy if you haven't done that anyway you're assuming the worst until we rule it out right but again you guys are already signed off on your next call by the time we're able to x-ray and see what's really going on but we assume the worst when we package the patient okay so c1 and c2 axis where are the dance okay so let me i'm going to jump out here and let's look at this radiographically Okay, so I'm going to play this for you. Um, it's going to scroll through. Let's see. Actually, that's a still shot. I'm sorry. And that's the one you saw. So we have, I'm going to move my mouse here as my pointer. So can you guys see C1? Can you see C2? And can you see any issues? And it was mentioned already. You kind of see the flaring here from the dental work. But right in here, that doesn't look like it's nice and even, huh? So we have atlas and we have axis, right, going up in. And it looks like it's compressed or there's something going on there, okay? So we can take other x-rays. We can change our, our plane on the CT. Uh, we can also take uh, an x-ray and look down. And um, let's look at the coronal plane here. Uh, try and get you full screen here. Okay, I'm going to play this. This is a patient that I brought in, a trauma patient from for an inner facility transport, brought him to the university. Um, and this was the CT scan. This was a, uh, I believe, 72-year-old female involved in an MVC, uh, single driver, restrained. Um, and the vehicle rolled, I think, two or three times. And the patient got out and was walking around when EMS arrived. So that's cool. Okay. They think they're okay. Then they get them to the hospital. You guys sign off, right? You're already gone and done. And they take a CT. And I'm going to play this. I want you to see if you can see. If you don't, it's okay. But remember that normal spacing and that kind of normal alignment, okay? And take a look and see if you can see anything. Okay, I'm going to pause it right there. You guys see the dens? What should the dens look like? It should look like my thumb, nice and solid, right? Looks good. Do you see anything wrong with that? Just looking at it. I know you're not radiologists. Neither am I. Not even x-ray tech that could really read. But understanding normal versus abnormal, at least generally, will give you an idea of what's wrong. So do you see a solid thumb there as you're looking at it? Take a look right here. What do you guys see? That should be a solid white piece, right? Solid thumb. So in a sense, that's almost as if my thumb is kind of broken right here. So there's a fracture of the dance. So what happens if I don't have this full thing and I only have a little bit right here in this circle? I still have quite a bit of movement, right? And of course, the spinal 
cord comes up and meets the, the brain stem in that area, right? Or a little higher up. And so if I move in that, I can, I'm loose. So that's an unstable fracture. Does that make sense? So um, these are images you guys don't get to see. So I'd love to be able to show those to you. Um, so we'll keep that running for a minute and we'll keep running through it until you see. So it's just going through and it's going back and forth right there. Okay, so pretty cool CT. Um, let's go back to our presentation here. And let's go into the thoracic vertebrae. Okay. So um, part of this is kind of tricky. When you have a patient who's injured, you get them in full spine. Let's say they can't move their lower legs or something like that. You're starting to think, hmm, they can't do that. I wonder where that is going to be. But we don't have our x-ray vision, right? So at what point do we say, hmm, this is a thoracic, this is a lumbar, you know, how do we know? And so it's safe to say uh, the way we call them, and you've probably seen this, uh, we label them in the medical world, right? There's always three names for one, but the easiest way to remember is C1 through C7, and then T1 through T12, okay? And that would C for cervical, T for thoracic, and the number, where you think it is. And so T10 is roughly about your belly button for a place of reference, okay, for a patient. So that'll give you a rough idea, um, and then you can kind of work up from there, okay? So let's do this. Let's say uh, normal versus abnormal. Let's do that first. So you have a really good, that's a normal spine. You guys see anything that looks weird to you? Looks pretty good. Notice the spacing looks pretty decent. You got a nice canal, right? There's no impingement or white or swelling or anything, and the processes look pretty good, okay? And, it's, and it curves nice and, and easy. How about that one? That looks like that hurt, huh? So what you're looking at here is potentially, I mean, that goes right through, right? Potentially either extreme impingement, the cord is pretty amazing. It's pretty, pretty tough. But imagine the force that caused that, right? So you get that impingement. You either have a partial transection or possibly even a complete tra transection of the spinal cord, and we'll, we'll get into that as well. But understanding, again, the normal alignment and spacing, which you guys don't typically get to see, and then I put a pretty obvious one. But we'll have some fun case studies that uh, may not be as obvious. Okay, there's the lumbar vertebrae, lower, tough. How many of you have back problems? How many of us do, right? We're always being told to protect our back with uh, lifting our patients and that kind of thing. Uh, how many have had to be seen for back problems? Those lumbar vertebrae are strong and they take a huge beating and sometimes they take a beating so much they remind us that we're still human, right? <laughs> that we're not superheroes. Um, so you see a normal, Normal scan, notice no impingement here, right? Good spacing here, looks, looks pretty good, okay? Again, uh, I know none of us are radiologists, I have so much respect for them, they're able to look at the littlest thing and pick something out, and I'm not. So I put some pretty obvious ones so you're able to see them, uh, but that looks good normal. So at this point, I love to take, we, uh, we have a few here in the audience, I'm gonna borrow some volunteers, I need two volunteers. Anybody willing to volunteer? Thank you, sir. We're too closest. Too closest. All right, we'll take the two closest. So imagine your vertebra like this, okay? So you guys look pretty strong. Got this ring here. If you'll hold one. Sure. And hold one and go ahead and pull that thing. Okay? That hurts. It's pretty tough, though, okay? So this is our intact vertebra, right? On anything, okay? So now, shoot, we got an NBC. And we have a fracture. Now pull that. Look how unstable that is and how vulnerable that is. Okay? Thank you, guys. Appreciate your help. So you can imagine if one or two of those fracture and they break, the instability that, are, that can occur on any one of those. Um, so and then you have the coccyx or the sacrum, right? Those fused in the bottom. How many of you have a sore tail bone? Sometimes you're sitting too long or you hurt it, you fall on it or something. 
Um, that takes a lot of force. It can still break and it can hurt. And that's the worst part. We sit a lot, right? All of us have to sit at some point. And when that little point there is broken or bruised or damaged, we know it. We don't know that thing exists until we hurt it and then it really exists. Um, thank heavens for those donut pillows and things, right? But even then it still hurts because all that weight's right there. Okay, so now we've kind of talked about the spine. Well, let's take a look at a uh, really cool picture. And this is something you guys don't get to see. We're going to do a top-down CT scan. So uh, you can kind of see we're just, we're just starting down and we're going to slice. I want you to watch the spine. I know it's tricky. Again, we're not radiologists here. This is not medical school. <laughs> uh, and so as it's going down, just kind of look and see if you guys can notice anything, okay? So a top-down view. There you go. You start to see the ventricles, the eyeballs as you move down. I didn't see any head bleed, that's good. Oh, there's the, the uh, dentals work. And you start to see the spine as you continue to move down. Can you see that canal? I know it disappears a little bit, but you can really see, you can see the processes, right? As we move through. So as a heads up, this is that same patient that I mentioned earlier that was in the uh, MVC uh, who fractured their dens. And so up above it was a little tricky to see, so you grab an x-ray, grab that side view, and you can see I showed that uh, with the little side here fractured. Um, but everything else going down in the vertebrae that you could see, it seemed like we could see a good spinous process, no fractures there. Didn't see a broken ring or a broken vertebra that way. And it didn't seem like there was swelling on the cord. So generally speaking, that scan looked pretty good. And again, I recognize that you guys in the field don't get a chance to really see that. We assume the worst package our patient can get them there. Um, but it's kind of cool to see now what you're really looking at uh, once they get a chance to get some imaging. All right, let's talk spinal cord. I love that picture. Isn't that amazing? Starting at the top here, coming all the way down. Notice how it splits out just like a, a horse's tail. We'll talk about that. You can see how it's very vascular. The spine is vascular. Uh, you've got ligaments and tissue around it. Okay, And of course, you're, uh, you hear about subdural and uh, dura mater, all of that. The subarachnoid space. This is a great image of that. And then all your nerves branching off from the cord depending on where you are, innervating areas of the body. Pretty incredible. And again, all of that's happening all the time. Tons of signals all, all at once going up and down and helping us function. It's pretty incredible. So, let's talk about what happens when trauma occurs. We talked about that normal view, right? Does that look like if we were to see that on a scan, a normal view? Okay. Think of the injuries that occur. So, you have this fractured body that's now impinging on the spinal cord. So I think it's safe to say if you feel spinous process fractures, it's safe to assume that there probably is some sort of vertebral body. Possibly not. You don't know them, but you guys don't have the, uh, the opportunity to see that, that imaging. You just get them to where they can get imaging. But it's safe to assume, and, and especially if the symptoms are similar, where they say, hey, I can't feel my legs, or I'm having, I'm, I've got this really bad tingling, uh, something like that. So it's very safe to assume that. So most likely, again, when the bones are affected, if it's a pretty bad trauma, bad fall, something, um, then most likely the cord will be affected. And again, you, uh, you put the two and two together with the, sim the, the symptoms the patient presents as well as what you're seeing. So now we talk about that transection, uh, complete and incomplete. 
So uh, think of it as an electrical system, the lights that are powered here. This, there's a grid, right? It goes to a circuit breaker, splits out, goes to all these uh, lights that give power. Imagine if part of that was cut, would we lose all power to this room but not to some rooms? Uh, would we lose it to the first row of lights and not the back row? Um, so it's very similar to what you see here. If there's a complete transection, then we have complete loss wherever that transection is, right? There's no more signal from the breaker box, if you will, getting up to the brain, to the breaker, or where it needs to go to have signal, okay? If there's partial transection, it depends on where it is, and based on, on this, it kind of gives you, it's really fine, but it'll tell you where you can have your sensations. Uh, you have your motor and uh, descending going down, and your afferent pathways going back up to the brain. And so if any of that is affected, that's going to affect the way that we respond. So now I want to talk about dermatomes. Um, dermatomes are what we saw in that, uh, that image I showed you. And so now we're talking specifically, if you can see on the uh, cervical side with the vertebra there. Um, so if something's injured in that section, then it's safe to say that, you know, C7, tricep, C6, 5, and so on, um, you have a significant injury. And as you go up, you can imagine what happens if we stop the signal at the breaker box. There's no signal, right? And so a very high cord injury, uh, you can either have death or, or issues like that. So other serious issues. So you have uh, C1 and C2, kind of our specialized, we'll talk about that. And then you have C4, C3 through C5. So what do you guys see here um, on C3, 4, and 5? Your diaphragm. What does our diaphragm do for us? Yeah, breathing. So imagine if you come to a patient who's fallen, right? And they're having difficulty breathing. And uh, you're suspecting a higher cord injury or uh, their cervical... Uh, vertebrae is affected, right? And they might even have a deformity. So we have a saying, C4, C3, C4, and C5, keep the diaphragm alive. So if you guys will say that, repeat that in your head, C3, C4, C5, keep the diaphragm alive. So again, going back to that patient, if your patient's having a, a hard time breathing, and they fall and they've hit their head, or they've moved their neck the wrong way, or you see some sort of deformity, or you feel a broken spinous process on the back in that high cervical area, it's very likely that they've injured anywhere between C3 and C5. And so that helps you zero in. You see how we're kind of putting that together with that. Um, if you understand the mechanism, you understand um, what their symptoms are, you can start to uh, deduce what, where possibly the injury is. Okay, C6 and C7, what does it say here? Got your uh, triceps, right? Your wrist extenders. So here's another one to remember. C6 and C7, raise your arms to heaven. Okay. So C3, C4, C5, do what? Keep your diaphragm alive, right? So breathing issues, complications there. C6 and C7, raise your arms to heaven. Yeah, so if we're having an issue in C6 or C7 and somebody can't move their arms, raise their arms, they, they're tingling or something, uh, then you can play the detective and, and possibly deduce they have a C6 or C7 injury. Okay, good. Okay, so there's T1 through T12, your chest muscles, okay, and your abdominal muscles. So let's say somebody is having a hard time breathing, but it seems like they're moving air, it's just that they're not getting movement in their chest. So what would you say there? So notice uh, T1, roughly between T T6 and T7, your thoracic muscles, your chest muscles, right, are innervated there. And so if there's compression on that or there's any, uh, anything affected, they may be able to breathe okay, but they're not able to move that air, right? They might be difficult to bag if you're using a BVM or something like that, and they don't have a pneumo or anything, tension pneumo or anything like that. And then the abdominal muscles as well, right? Okay, L1, L5, ah, my legs are tingling. I can't feel my legs. Okay, um, and then your sacral nerves. Okay, so let's put this together. Now that you know, so remember C3, 4, and 5 do what? Yes. 
And C6 and C7. Good. So what would you say T1 through roughly T7 or so? So your thoracic, right, muscles to move the air. Good. Good. So let's take a look at this. 27-year-old male who hangs himself. You respond to the scene in time. The patient is barely breathing. What are you guys thinking? Good. So C1 through C3. Uh, and why, why are you thinking that? What's leading you to think that? Yes. Yeah, mechanism plus respiratory distress. So I think it's safe. How many of you, well, let's show the image here. Ouchie. Yeah, isn't that incredible? We call that the hangman's fracture for a reason, right? It was a very effective uh, form of capital punishment. It was pretty, uh, pretty, um, pretty quick and pretty finite, right? And why? Because we caused that high up cord injury and we can either get a complete transection or at least affect to the point where um, we affect everything down below, including your breathing, right? Okay, good, you guys got that one. So the high cord injury, C1 and C2, yeah, the signal's blocked. Um, again, high up, because all that signal coming from the brain, right, the brain stem, that's also affecting your heart, right? So heart rate, all of that. And if that's blocked and that signal's not getting there, then, that's unfortunate. Okay, how about this one? Hopefully these sound like some of the calls that you have all been on. 80-year-old female falls at home and has, a very, has very fragile bones per medical history, osteoporosis, that kind of thing, okay? She is a GCS of 14. Her vitals are stable, so her blood pressure is okay, those kinds of things, heart rate's okay. But she can't move her arms. What are you guys thinking? Yeah, raise your arms to heaven, right? Five through seven. So a cervical injury possibly, right, most likely. I can't move my arms. I can't feel my arms, but I can wiggle my toes. I have a good pedal pulse. I'm able to move my legs, okay? There you go. The brachial plexus nerves um, are what uh, are innervated there. So that's raising your arms to heaven, right? Does that look fun? That looks sore, doesn't it? Um, so do we, everything look okay here? It looks pretty decent until we get here, right? Obviously, you can see this inflammation, this uh, impingement on the cord here. And so that's going to affect what you're feeling and what you can do. Okay, here's one. 36-year-old construction worker who falls off of some scaffolding 25 feet high, lands on his feet, right? It happens. Sometimes people can react. Boom. Okay? Land on my feet, imagine the force, and then sits down. Has an obvious left femur fracture, uh, slightly hypotensive when you're assessing the patient, but otherwise the vitals are good, but he cannot fill his legs. So what area do you think is affected of the spine? Okay. Could be thoracic, uh, possibly, and uh, could even be into the lumbar, right? That lower back just takes a beating. <laughs> with all that force, okay? Survey says, there you go. Look at that scan. That looks sore, doesn't it? Okay, L1 through L5 with the lower spinal cord affected. Okay, so now we mentioned this, um, Zach mentioned this, let's talk about our mechanisms of injury. Um, you respond to a call, you get a brief report as we mentioned in some of our case studies, um, and you can start to formulate a plan based on what you uh, heard and know, right? You may not have very much information, but you at least can have an idea. But I thought I'd have a humorous um, moment to talk about mechanism of injury. Let's see. Do we have sound? I'm sorry. Is there a sound thingy? Okay. 
Okay, because it's not funny without sound. the best part. Well, at least I won't have to drive very far. <laughs> Just a little humor though there. My thanks to the Freeway Patrol uh, authors. They're, they're, they have some great stuff. Um, so we can learn a lot from mechanism of injury. And so if we have a fall or we have something blunt, um, we can formulate a picture and maybe a, a plan. Even though we're still going to package our, place, our patient as soon as they're in full spine precaution, um, this at least gives us an idea of what could have happened. So understanding the mechanism uh, can help you give that idea. And so with this type, with, with injuries in general, there's some sort of force involved. And so when we talk about injuries, we break it up. Uh, we have the transfer of energy to the body from an outside force, and that's kinetic energy, right? So that could be your MVC or, or something like that. Um, and that kinetic energy is blunt or sharp. And so oftentimes, maybe over the radio, we hear you know blunt trauma or MVC. So we can think, OK, well, this is a blunt. Or if we're responding to a, a shooting or stabbing or something like that, then it's going to be the sharp, right? So we can start to characterize what could have happened. So there you go. There's your stabbings or shootings or any other sharp objects that penetrate the body. Look at that. That doesn't look good, right? Where are we at? Let's see. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Eh, roughly around C7, maybe. Maybe uh, T1. Okay. There you go. Okay, falls. I showed you that example. Somebody falls, right, from 25 feet. Let's say they land on their feet. That force is transferred up, right? So you get this type of injury here um, called a burst fracture. Okay, so that burst from that force, boom, kind of breaks something like that, and there's little fragments. And then, because of that, see this fragment here that can go into the cord or at least push on that cord? So that's where you're going to get those symptoms, depending on where it is at the cord, right? My legs are tingling. I can't move my arms. I'm having a hard time breathing, uh, and so on. Okay, so let's have a little fun here. What do you guys think that mechanism is? What does that look like to you on the image? Yeah, mm -hmm. good. So what do you think happened? Somebody, uh, so we're saying compression. So I'm thinking somebody probably had some sort of landing or something like that, even if they landed on their, uh, their rear end, not their legs or their feet. 
Uh, yeah, I guess it'd be good to land on your feet, not your legs, right? Um, but that prayer, well, I guess you could if, you're, if you end up kneeling or something. Somehow you're trying to go feet first, not head first, right? Um, and so, yeah, that compression occurred. Okay. Um, blunt. Again, blunt force. It can happen. And you see how that head is, as in the case of an MVC, right? If they're going really fast and they get that diffuse axonal injury and you have your coup and contra coup, right? There's another sharp injury. Ouch. I, don't ask me how that could happen. Okay, so let's apply that mechanism of injury. You have a 32-year-old male who's in an MVC, partially ejected, pinned for 10 minutes, and then self-extricates himself. You arrive on scene. This isn't uncommon for you guys when you arrive on these types of scenes, right? So you arrive on scene. He's hypotensive, says that his legs are numb. He has a BP of 66 over 52, GCS of 15, and an intact airway. So I know there's other priorities. You're taking care of the airway, right? We're doing our ABCs, that kind of thing. What stands out to you for this guy? Okay, a little concerned about the blood pressure, right? Hypotensive for sure. Okay. Neurodeficits. Neurodeficits, possible, good. He's a GCS of 15 talking to you right now, so that's a good thing, right? So we know the airway's intact if they're able to communicate, talk to you. Um, but the legs are numb. So what do you think a mechanism of uh, injury would be for this type of patient? So MBC, partial ejection. It takes a lot to be removed from the vehicle. So Got a lot of weight on you, right? Physics is waiting Yeah. So what caused the rollover anyway if they're pinned, right? So maybe they had initial injury, blunt force there. Then it rolls, and then they're partially ejected. Then you have a crush, right? So it's all blunt, I think it's safe to say. Uh, so what would you expect um, spinal injury-wise? What do you think you'd see if he's partially ejected? So let's say half and half. Okay? Yeah. I think that's good. So uh, thoracic of some sort, right? Maybe into lumbar. Luckily, hopefully cervical, unless there was some sort of diffuse axonal injury before the roll, okay? Or they weren't pinned here and then moved somehow. Physics are incredible, aren't they? Okay. So we're thinking, thinking uh, thoracic or lumbar. Okay. So let's continue with this patient. So now I want to bring spinal shock and neurogenic shock into the mix, okay? Because this is, this is as your patient progresses. Let's say from the scene, you're not going to fly the patient because you're close enough to a definitive uh, area of care. However, it's probably a 20, 25 minute ambulance ride, okay? So they're in the ambulance with you and you have IV access, patient's packaged. Uh, I'm sorry, 20 minutes instead of 25, so even less time. That's good. Shave five minutes off. Uh, your patient's talking to you. He's had three liters of NS, and his blood pressure has come up a little, but it's still hypotensive. When you say 75 over 53, he says his legs are numb, and then you notice he is warm. Uh, he has good color in his upper body, but his lower body is cold and pale. Okay? You notice on your spinal check that he has step-offs and deformities in his lower thoracic area. So again, what's going on? What would you guys do? What do you think? Drive faster, yes. <laughs> Drive faster, good. Okay, so pressors is mentioned. This is where we talk about that, right? So we have uh, spinal shock going on, right? So there's some sort of trauma to the spine. We don't know where exactly. Again, we don't have that x-ray vision, but it's, I think it's safe to anticipate that. They're in full spine anyway. There's not much more you can do that way. But you do have IV access. You did notice a bump, but for three liters in this patient, and you're not seeing much, okay? Yeah, and then you have good color, warm right here, and then nothing below, right? Um, so we, is, I think it's safe to, to assume probably thoracic lumbar, like we're saying somewhere, there's probably some impingement, okay? And now this spine, this patient's spine is in shock. It's going crazy. So when you break it down, there's tons of different definitions and things to think about when it comes to spinal and neurogenic shock. I like to simplify it and say that your spinal shock typically is going to be your neuro... Uh, or muscular skeletal is what I'm trying to say. So, you know, your motor stuff, your control of muscles, that kind of thing. You can't feel your tingling. The neurogenic is going to be uh, your vasoactive, your distributive issues. So I think, and it was mentioned exactly, we've given three liters, we're still at 75 over 53, and we're not innervating 
somehow we're having an issue innervating our vessels and vasculature to get the um, vasoconstriction that we need to maintain our blood pressure. Because that's the body's natural reaction, right? That fight or flight, we vasoconstrict and try and keep our blood pressure up, try and perfuse the brain and that kind of thing. We're tachycardic, okay? This patient was tachycardic, so we give them some pain medicine to try and help with that, and they're still tachycardic, and their blood pressure has come, to, has come up a little bit, but it, it's not improving. Um, so obviously, we're trying to get to a surgeon in blood, most likely, right? There's some, something going on, but we don't see what's going on. But the other thing that's going on is the innervation to that vasculature is affected because of the spinal injury. So now we're not getting that vasoconstriction we need. Instead, we're getting vasodilation. Thus, we're warm here. So we probably have some vasoconstriction up here, but we're not getting it down below. Okay? That could also be contributed to blood loss. Maybe the patient has a pelvic fracture as well. You, you don't know. That's why we're taking them to a trauma one center anyway. Okay? But it's good to know. And so how do we treat that? And it was mentioned here. So we know that the conduction system is blocked or damaged. The transmission and reception is affected. We have spinal swelling, right, or spinal shock. We get that vasodilation. We have breathing problems. And we get those sensory deficits. So we have our access, and we're doing the best we can for our patient. And so the answer in this case, if it's within your scope of practice, after three liters of fluids, noticing that type of uh, pathology, then uh, a vasopressor of some sort would be effective uh, and would be a good consideration to add for this patient for the time being. All right, so here's that spinal shock, right? Here's our scan. So we're seeing impediment on the spinal cord itself and inflammation, right? So our, our signal transfer is, has issues. So that's the first thing. And then we have our neuro, neurogenic shock where we can't vasodilate and maintain that, okay? So now we move into the fun part. You come on this patient, um, and let's say they're having a difficult time breathing. How do you manage an airway while we know there's probably some cervical spine issues? Can we manipulate that? Are we supposed to? Those are some things I wanted to address in this presentation because it's pretty crucial. So, of course, naturally, in order to address this, uh, I refer to minds greater than my own, so I start doing some research and looking at the studies out there. So one of them I found, I just like to uh, put it up there, um, is that uh, spinal neutrality is key. And when we're talking about good airway management, that's our goal anyway. So if you think about this, um, I like the example of smelling the roses, right? Of course, when you're, you come on a call like this and it's chaotic, our adrenaline's up, we're breathing like crazy, things are just going crazy. So this is where I tell everybody to stop and smell the roses. And so if you think about how we sniff and how we smell flowers, right? It could be your favorite flower, whatever. Do we walk around like this and smell the flower or talk to people like this? And how many of us us in adrenaline rushes and trying to do a good BVM management have seen a patient's neck back like this while we're still trying to hold C-spine, right? It happens, okay? So we don't do that. Do we walk around like this and smell the flowers? And do we put patients in this type of position? Not typically, right? When we sniff, if you think about it, we just have a nice natural alignment. The spine is naturally aligned anyway, okay? And that's how we're supposed to position our patients as we're looking at airway. So, um, you want to consider your alternate airways and adjuncts as well as you're getting uh, prepared for that. But good spinal alignment is huge. Can we do that with the C-spine, with the uh, C-collar? What do you guys think? How many of you have seen the sweet geriatric patients that, you know, we're using the best size of C-collar that we can and their necks like down in the collar, <laughs> they slip through, right? So good placement is key and good positioning is key before we place that C-collar that, uh, in place. Okay, let's look at that curvature. So we talk about that sniffing position, right? See how there's that natural curve right here? You can see the line here. And then right here, I've kind of pulled it straight, right? It doesn't look natural. Uh, maybe that's the, um, those rings or something, right? Straightening the neck like that, but that's not natural. It should be a nice curvature right there. Okay, so here's that study. Uh, this is just one of many. This one was in uh, 2014. So uh, the purpose was to minimize, they just looked at it and they wanted to minimize risk of spinal cord injury while um, manipulating and, and 
uh, maintaining C-spine. So here's the fun conclusion. <laughs> Isn't this comforting? Look at the top there, at least from this study. Overall, there is no perfect way. <laughs> Great, I want you to tell me. You did the research, tell me I want to do it better, right? But uh, really, it says use your expertise, use your clinical judgment, maintain good alignment, and try for that sniffing position as best you can. Maybe it's going to take some towels or something under the uh, shoulders or ways to maintain that alignment. Um, my favorite part, though, and this is key, right? Look at this last part. Well, providers remain vigilant about preventing secondary injury in patients with cervical spine injury. They must keep in mind that forces during intubation and positioning are likely to pale in comparison to the forces that cause the initial injury. So in other words, breathing's important, right? <laughs> So to get an airway, a definitive airway, is, is really important. So do the very best you can maintaining that alignment, uh, C-spine alignment. Of course, we assume the worst. Minimize the movement and the manipulation you do. But if you need to get an airway, you need to get an airway because breathing's good, right? So that was a very interesting study. So now, uh, let's move into some other spinal issues. These are things that we'll probably see in our communities. We have our quadriplegics, our paraplegics. We might have our regular that calls and is in need, uh, not only for assistance to go somewhere or move, but a lot of times they have some of these issues that come up. Um, this is an issue known as autonomic dysreflexia, okay? Um, I spent a little time in the burn, well, a lot of time. I loved the burn ICU um, as a burn ICU nurse. And we had a few patients that uh, I've taken care of over the years that were uh, paraplegic or quadriplegic from something else. And then as a result, maybe they didn't have that sensation, so they burned their foot or their toe or, or needed the wound care. So that's why they're there. So I go in to do wound care, and we've medicated the patient. We have a great relationship with them and do the best we can. And I start to clean that wound, right? And then what happens? The patient starts to get kind of flushed. That leg shakes even though they don't have sensation there, but it, it's, uh, they're getting this weird sensation. And what's happening is the brain is trying to process this, this uh, stimuli, but the body doesn't know what to do with it, right? Because they don't have that motor movement or anything. And so that's a, a, a function known as autonomic dysreflexia. So you might have patients that you respond on and their pressure's all, blood pressure's all over the place, their heart rate's up, they're really flushed, and they're a quadriplegic, they're a paraplegic, and you can't figure out what's going on. They've been able to take care of themselves forever, and you see these vital signs, and you think, well, what do we do? And so the answer to try and prevent this is to try and stop the, the uh, stimulus, whatever that is. A lot of these patients uh, have to do self-catheterization, right? And so it might be as simple as the catheter caused the stimulus, which caused this, uh, this to occur. And so that's when they call because they're panicked and they're worried, they're not sure what's going on. I think it still warrants transport to more definitive care for sure because there might be something else that's going on underneath that. But certainly understanding that, one of the best ways to try and prevent or to uh, stop this is to find out what the stimulus is and stop the stimulus. Okay, catasequina, that's that sacral injury when you fall and hit. I um, was working triage in the emergency department one day and had a patient come in, uh, walked in, we were talking with them, they seemed fine, and so I put him into, uh, we have different areas uh, of the emergency department where we can kind of triage and figure out where they need to go. So I sent him over into this one area, and uh, I asked, I thought some good triage, que triage questions, you know, vital signs were okay. And so I sent them over there, and they explained their symptoms. You know, I'm having some sacral pain. It's really sore. I'm like, oh, okay, did you fall recently? Um, I was in an ac a car accident a while ago. Okay. So we sent them over there. The provider sees them, and then they came over to give me some feedback, which I welcome and was very appreciated. And he said, this individual has cauda sequina. Did you ask them if they were incontinent? And I did not. And this person was. They couldn't. They were incontinent of urine. And so... What you have, remember in that, uh, that earlier picture, we had that almost horse's tail where those uh, nerves branch out of the sacrum, right? Like a horse's tail, thus cauda sequina. And in, any of those are affected, they can affect the genitalia, they can affect your uh, ability to, uh, you know, to go to the bathroom and that kind of thing. Um, so those are symptoms that that's affected, uh, has been affected. So certainly with those sacral injuries, um, that can be huge because there's a huge branch that just come out right there like a horse's tail. All right, 
Here's the fun, hot debate, right? Backboards. Anybody hearing that's here, I don't know about you guys in cyberspace, uh, about backboards. Do we use them? Heck yeah. Are they convenient? Yeah. Are we still using them a ton? Yes. Should we? Hmm. I'm going to throw this out here, right? <laughs> Topic of debate, OK? So I'm going to show you a few pictures of pressure points. Um, I didn't say this at the beginning. I may mention medications if I do. I'm not receiving this is kind of my little disclaimer at the end of the towards the end of the presentation. Not receiving uh, any endorsements or getting paid or anything to talk about any particular product at all. It's more just to give you a visual image of what's happening with uh, some of these things. If I mention a particular medication, it's because it's pretty much what we all use, right? We're pretty used to that. So, uh, but backwards. So let me show you a picture. Oh, there's the cotisequina, by the way, the horse's tail. Sure looks like it, right? So imagine, look at that big branch. If any one of those is injured, impeded, anything, you get all those symptoms. So there's your backboards. Okay. Here's our problem. Now, when you guys see pressure ulcers, what are you thinking with pressure ulcers? Yeah, been in bed forever, whatever. They already had it. Um, oftentimes, our, again, our quadriplegics, our paraplegics are at high risk, or our geriatric population. Would you believe me if I said this was possibly a 26-year-old uh, male? Okay, well, quite honestly, I don't know in that picture. And if you look at the skin, <laughs> it looks kind of fragile, so maybe a geriatric patient. But it has happened. If they've been on a backboard long enough, depending on your transport, and including in flight, if we do a fixed-wing transport, that's something we have to seriously consider when we're transporting patients. But this is what they're finding is happening with backboards. Uh, you know, you have sensitive skin, soft skin, and it doesn't take long. And it depends on the person and how much tissue they have. Uh, but it is becoming a problem. And thus, using backboards is becoming a debate. I'll tell you what, though. For us to transport a patient, they are very convenient, aren't they? They're, they're great. Patients strap down, spider strap. We pick them up. We load them into the aircraft or the ambulance or wherever we need to go. And it just makes life so much easier. Or if they're slightly combative before they get some sort of sedative of, of something, it almost helps restrain them a little bit, right? For safety. OK, so here is a picture of pressure points laying down on a backboard. And I bet you this company, um, whoever it is, probably took one of their healthy employees and said, hey, will you lay on here on this backboard? And we're going to do a before and after, and we're going to take an image here. So it's probably a healthy person laying down on this backboard. Look at the pressure points. Okay. Now look what we do if we do, um, this is this particular brand, but if you have some sort of soft point or if we don't use a backboard at all. Okay. So it can kind of show you just a normal backboard how much, and, and these usually are the problem areas, okay, um, what a backboard can do. So there is a study, again, I went back to 2014. And uh, obviously, it talks about the purpose of backboards, what we need, and what the results are. And uh, it said that, yeah, we're looking at pressure ulcers, and they're up, stage, up to stage four. And, so, and there's more studies out there, but I like this one. Again, I also recognize we're in medicine, right, or in any uh, scientific field, there's pros and cons and research to show positive and negatives. But uh, I truly believe in this because I, I have not, hopefully I've not been a cause of a pressure ulcer, but I've transported patients for a long period of time. And um, we've now developed a policy in our program so that we don't have to use a backboard and we can transfer them in full spine still to keep them safe and get them on a softer gurney or something. But even the gurney, right? Even the gurney or the hospital bed once they're in the hospital uh, can become an issue. So we have some possible solutions, right? Some of you guys have seen this. Again, no endorsement for this product, but I've, I've used that. I bet you haven't on scene. It's nice. It gets some padding, of course, right? Which is better than that hard backboard. There is talk. Maybe at some point, who knows, that maybe backboards will phase out. So what do we do? <laughs> How do we keep our patient in full spinal precautions? Um, I mean, we, I, I responded to a scene out in the middle of nowhere. We landed. Um, great agency with volunteer firefighters and the way they landed this was with a Makita drill light with our MVGs. That's all they had. One had to kind of hike into where the it was a motor vehicle accident um, off-road and 
they didn't have a backboard or anything, and we're right there, so we could load them. And so what we did was grab our aircraft gurney, which is pretty skinny, but straight, and use that as our, our backboard, but it's padded. Um, you can still maintain C-spine. We still had to buckle them in to be safe for flight. Um, so just, just ideas. But I know on, on ground transport, uh, you've got your hospital, your, um, your gurney there, right? So maybe that instead of the uh, backboard. However, what if you're getting them out of an MVC and they're, you're extricating and they're stuck? And you need to maintain that C-spine and find a way to properly carry them. So... Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I don't have a 100% solution. I just like to talk about it when you're referring to spinal uh, trauma and, and spine issues and full spine precautions because it's something to be aware of for sure. All right, you guys. Well, this is where I come to the end. Um, thank you very much for your participation. I wanted to check and see if we have any questions. Uh, can you talk about pain management and um, spinal, spinal injuries? Great like question. What, uh, you know, that's just what it says. But, sure. Um, yeah, you just want to touch on that a little bit? Great, you, you bet. Can you please repeat the question, too? Sure. So uh, pain management is huge. I appreciate you bringing that up. So uh, for pain management, I would say do what you can. It's difficult if you come upon a patient who is hypotensive, right? Uh, typically, most rigs, just having been out and talking with some of the agencies, uh, a lot of you carry morphine. Um, some of you carry fentanyl. Um, again, I like fentanyl because it doesn't tend to affect the hemodynamic status like morphine or Dilaudid or some of these other medications do. The other thing too, they're all narcotics, right? Um, narcotics will cause nausea. And so you're trying to treat their pain, but they're probably already nauseous from trauma in general. And so be sure and medicate with uh, some sort of anti-emetic as well um, that will work. So. I, I like to use fentanyl again, my drug of choice. It is quick acting, but it's a good quick pain reliever. It doesn't affect the hemodynamic dynamic status as much. If you don't carry fentanyl, uh, you have to be judicious with uh, the blood pressure. Uh, in the case of this patient that I flew that was uh, the MBC that we talked about, the case study where uh, the leg couldn't really fill their legs and they were pale, um, I just used 25 micrograms of fentanyl to start. You can always give more, right, to start light. So if you don't carry fentanyl and you have morphine, use your best judgment. Maybe start with a little uh, morphine to give a little pain control as much as you can and work your way up as best you can. Hopefully that answered your question. And then what was that second part? No, that, that was it. Just, okay. talk, just asking about pain management. Okay, pain management, yeah. The, very important though, definitely, right? Especially with our trauma patients in general. Yes? This one's for me. Okay. Um, since most pre-hospital providers aren't carrying the same pressors that um, flight teams are using, can you just comment, since we do have kind of a broad audience, what would possibly be the best you know, pressor for this patient, for a, a spinal injury patient? Great. Maybe you can help shed light, because uh, I'm so spoiled and used to having access to many. What, <laughs> what do you sure think is the most common? That, well, I'm in the same boat as you. Like, you, know, you think, think epi? epi drips are probably as, yeah. as so. close as you're I think an epinephrine drip would be very appropriate. Absolutely. You could, whatever you need to help bump that blood pressure up. And again, start light, get it to where you can. Part of that patient's problem also was they needed surgeon and, a, and blood, needed a surgeon and blood product uh, too. But, but all, of course, we had that spinal impingement. So we manage our airway first, right? Do your ABCs. Uh, we got that going. And then uh, once you get the patient tucked in and we're en route to wherever you're going, uh, you can consider that pain management, and uh, if epi is what you've got, put a whiff of epi on on a drip and see how that helps with your blood pressure. But ultimately, there's going to come a point where we've got epi and we've got tons of fluid on, but they're losing blood, and so what we need to do is get them to that definitive care to stop that. So do the best you can, but if epi is what you've got, uh, great. If you have another presser that works that your agency carries within your scope of practice, uh, use what you have. That was, that was, yeah, okay. <laughs> that was, that was a question. Yeah, that's a good question, though. Well, it's tough to, and, you know, I, I think about that patient you presented there with the, they're very hypotensive. They are Glasgow 15, but that's going to bottom out mm -hmm. eventually and probably quicker than you guys would think or those out there treating that patient would think. And so I was just curious what, you know, what tools would you pass along to our EMS friends out there? Because you're right, we are, we are lucky. 
we have an endless supply, basically, of all the cool stuff that's going to treat that patient without any difficulty. I was just trying to figure out a way to prepare these guys in the field, you know, when they do see that um, yeah. spinal shock patient, because they're out there, and we're in the middle of that season now, where, you know, these, these people are going to start to show up, so I appreciate you just making that quick comment. Oh, thanks, Zach. So, uh, I know Zach didn't have a microphone. Um, it sounds like, generally speaking, most agencies at least have epinephrine, um, and can do an epinephrine drip, so I think epi would be the best. Uh, we are, he talked about how we're kind of spoiled as a flight team. We have lots of different pressures we can choose from. Um, if your agency has the opportunity to carry levofed or norepinephrine, that's another great one. Um, it's titratable and, and the mixture is pretty easy to do, so I like to use that as well. Um, so if you have access to that. So great point, Zach. Yes? Uh, this one came from one of our cyberspace viewers as well. It's just they want you to discuss the trauma assessment for a potential spinal injury. Can you just Great. do that or okay. just kind of your methodology? Sure. I've seen you work before and it's pretty <laughs> impressive. So you well, you're, yeah, thanks. Thanks. you're giving me a lot of credit. Maybe I bought him lunch or sometime when we were working, right? Thanks, so. <laughs> Zach. Um, that's a great question. So the trauma assessment, um, really, if you've had any type of trauma assessment training, um, for nurses, there's a, there's a TNCC course, um, uh, you have the ATCN courses, that kind of thing. But really what it comes down to, I hate to, to be so cliche, but the truth is it's what you've been training and what you're trained to do right away. You come in and you assess your ABCs, right? And you go all the way from a, a quick head-to-toe uh, head to toe assessment. What I like to do, I also do what the military likes to do just quickly. And I also do what's called that blood sweep. Maybe some of your agencies do that, just to make sure we're not missing any hemorrhaging. Um, and then they might already be packaged. If we're flying in and picking somebody up, they might already be packaged on a backboard and ready to go uh, because your agency's done a great job. If they're not and you arrive right there, obviously we're going to assume the worst, right? We're going to assume full spine precautions and assume that they've broken something there. And so uh, if you have a chance to palpate and fill and talk to the patient if they don't have any airway compromise, it's a great way to assess your airway as you're doing that. You know, tell me, does this hurt? If they're talking to you, you get a good sense of their neurologic status when they're talking to you. And then obviously you'll prepare to package them and go from there. If you notice step, off for, step offs or deformities, you got to notate it obviously and be mindful of that. But the truth is, what are you going to do in the field differently? If you really think about it, let's say, okay, we know it's some sort of cervical injury. Some could be spinal or something. Maybe their legs are numb. Um, you know, remembering those mnemonics, uh, three, four, and five, keep the diaphragm alive. So C3 through C5, that'll help you. If they're having a hard time breathing, uh, they're not having a hard time moving their chest muscles, but they're having a hard time breathing, then that can allude to the diaphragm, okay? Uh, and then six, five through seven, I can raise my hands. Can you raise your hands? Can you move your arms? Okay, so we know five through seven is okay. So those are the little things, those kinds of questions you can ask um, to determine roughly where the issue is going to be. And again, about T10 is your belly button, just to give you a reference point. Okay, but ultimately, when you're in the field, uh, you're going to package them and you're going to get them to definitive care. So there's not a whole ton that you can do other than making sure, because uh, they're going to be in full spine or should be anyway. Uh, and you're assuming the worst until we rule it out, right? Um, and then you're going to do good airway management if needed, and then uh, treat the vitals as you see, and, and treat your patient uh, with pain management and uh, that pressure if need be, um, that kind of thing. So great question. Thank you very much. That's all there is. It's good. All right, you guys. Thanks again. It was an honor to be with you. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity, and uh, look forward to seeing you out there in the field.